Good morning. I think my mic might be a little bit hot. Good morning. Well, it looks like we're going to be small but mighty this morning. Uh, so you're just going to have to sing extra loud. Uh, and uh, I've been preaching from First John. And uh, the lectionary again today. Oh, I need to move over here. Sorry about that folks at home. Uh, I was standing in the wrong spot. They, they very conveniently put a little pe black piece of tape on the floor right here for me, but sometimes I don't see it. John is uh, sometimes called the apostle of love, and uh, that's going to be the focus today, the, the love of God. And I'm going to begin with 1 John 4 and verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. In other words, the, in this, the love of God was made visible. Um, in this, the love of, love of God was made apparent to us. In this, the love of, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. Let's stand together to worship God. Our great God of love, we come this morning recognizing that we come without any power of our own to properly praise you. So we call upon your spirit to infuse us with the joy that should be in our hearts for all that you've done for us. Rain down upon us in your love this morning that we can show your love to one another, to a watching and needy world, and especially to you as we lift up our hearts in praise. Fill us with the joy of your spirit this morning and let that joy be our strength. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Open your bulletin to the prayer of confession, and I invite you to join with me to pray aloud. Let's pray together. 
God of glory and love, you have loved us from the beginning. And in love you sent your Son into the world for us. You have called us to love one another as you have loved us. And we confess before you our complete unwillingness to obey this command. We are often consumed with jealousy and we harbor hatred in our hearts. Instead of laying down our lives for others, we expect them to serve us and resent them when they don't. Forgive us, Lord. Fill us again with your spirit and transform us into people who extend your love to others. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, I want to share with you uh, once again from 1 John chapter 4 and beginning with verse 10. But before I do, I need to define a, a word. Uh, there's a particular theological term in this text, propitiation. And it means a sacrifice that puts aside anger. Uh, a sacrifice that satisfies God's righteous wrath and anger against sin. So hear this word from the Lord, 1 John 4.10. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Know that Christ has fully satisfied the righteous wrath of God in the sacrifice that he made on the cross. He took our place. And because of this, we know that we are loved. Amen. Sin with such love. 
be seated. Um, Larry Carpenter uh, has been in the hospital the last few days uh, and uh, is, has been stuck there a little bit longer than expected. He's uh, had a bowel obstruction that required uh, a couple of surgeries. Um, he was, they, they were hoping, uh, Levon was hoping he was going to come home uh, Friday, but that didn't work out. And uh, as far as I know, uh, this morning, he's still there. So uh, let's pray for, pray for Larry this morning. Um, among EPC Idaho churches, we're praying for the Evangelical Valley Presbyterian Church in Hazleton. And their pastor is Jim Day. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as I lead us. And as always, I'll give you the opportunity to give the Lord names of people you're concerned about. But let's pray. Mighty God, uh, we give you thanks and praise today. In love, you created this world. In, in love, you created us, men and women, in your own image. You created us to know you and to walk with you in a relationship of love and trust. And, oh God, uh, we rebelled against you right from the beginning, right from our, from our first parents. We rebelled against you, but you never stopped loving us. You made covenant with your people Israel that you would be their God and they would be your people. And you made that covenant so that your light would shine through the people of Israel to give light to all the world, to show all the world uh, who you are, uh, that all, all the world might come to know you and return your love. Uh, we thank you for the ultimate demonstration of your love, the gift of your son, Jesus. Uh, and we thank you, uh, Lord, for a, a gift beyond measure. Uh, we can never thank you enough that Jesus went to the cross in our place and took upon himself the punishment that was due to us so that we could be restored to you so that we could know you and know your love and walk in your love. Uh, Father, we pray, uh, grow us in love. May the world see in the way that we love one another and in the way that we love our neighbors. May the world see that there is a difference in us. Father, we uh, thank you that you are the great physician, you're the great healer, and uh, you care about uh, you care about us uh, when we are sick or afflicted, and uh, we lift up uh, Larry Carpenter to you this morning, and we pray, uh, fill him with your healing Holy Spirit, and we pray, uh, Lord, uh, that he'd be able to come home uh, very soon, and uh, that uh, he'll be back on his back on his feet and uh, and healed. Father, we thank you for the whole church of Jesus Christ all over the world. And we pray this morning that you would build up your church in love. Uh, strengthen your church. And we pray especially for the church in places uh, where uh, Christians are being persecuted today. Uh, where uh, Christians have to meet in secret where they face arrest and abuse and even death because uh, they name the name of Jesus. So we pray, uh, build up your church, O oh Lord. Build us up in love. We ask your blessing uh, 
not only on this church, but all of the different churches uh, around this valley, even as they're meeting this morning. Father, pour out your Holy Spirit in a fresh way. We pray especially for the Evangelical Valley Presbyterian Church in Hazleton. We ask your blessing on their ministry. We ask your blessing on their pastor, Jim Day, and his wife, Cindy. Now, if any of you uh, would like to lift anybody up to the Lord right now, just give their name to the Lord out loud right now. And now let's offer together the prayer that Jesus gave us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be. verses 25 to 31. I will be reading from the English Standard Version. Let us pray. Dear Lord, guide us by your holy word. As we read this scripture, open our hearts to know you. Teach us to walk with Jesus in the knowledge of your love and grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the word of God. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. The word of the Lord. Please stand.
seated. <clears throat> and open your Bible to John's first epistle, not John's gospel, but uh, John's first letter. It's there uh, in the, toward the back of your New Testament. Um, before I read it, uh, just uh, one, one announcement. Um, it's that time of year again uh, where we are asking you to consider a special gift for what's called the EPC Asking Offering. Um, we are, of course, a member of congregation of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Uh, there are uh, regional uh, governing bodies of which we are a part uh, that uh, have some expenses. Uh, we are a part of the Presbytery of the Pacific Northwest, and uh, there are some expenses involved there, and also our uh, national offices uh, in Orlando uh, and our General Assembly uh, have uh, expenses. The General Assembly is the national gathering of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church every summer. And uh, every year the EPC uh, asks every church to give a, a certain amount per member. And this year, this year it's $44 per member. Uh, so our session is asking you to consider, and this is completely voluntary. It is not required. Uh, it's, not a member, it's not your membership dues or anything like that. Uh, but uh, if you would consider a gift of $44 for each member in your family, uh, just make it out to Christ Presbyterian Church and write <coughs> asking on the memo line. Uh, that would be a big help. So I, I leave that to you. And there are details about it on the back of the bulletin. So, 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. Hear now the word of God. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved, but that God loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. The word of the Lord. Let's bow together. O oh God, Jesus said, your word is truth. Open our hearts now and write your word within us so that we might be shaped to be more like Jesus, your living word, in whose name we pray. Amen. Um, <clears throat> I know that uh, I have told you before I'm going to tell you again. Uh, there, there's a uh, there's a phrase uh, in our that gets used a lot uh, in our society these days. Uh, 
I, and it's a phrase, it's, it, it, it refers to something that I believe does not exist. And uh, our, our young people are exposed to this uh, when they take uh, sex ed in school. The phrase is safe sex. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing. God designed us, sex makes us vulnerable. It's, it's dangerous. And I don't mean always in a bad way. It makes us vulnerable to one another. It opens us to intimacy. And there's tremendous risk in that. No such thing as safe sex. Now, if there's no such thing as safe sex, there's also no such thing as safe love. Love will never be safe. Remember the Wizard of Oz? Remember he told the tin man he didn't know how lucky he was that he didn't have a heart? Love makes us vulnerable to be hurt, to be misunderstood, to be embarrassed to be taken advantage of. Love is powerful, it has enormous life-giving potential, and it's dynamite. Uh, I want to read you something. Uh, it's one of my favorite paragraphs from C.S. Lewis in, in one of his best books. He wrote a book called The Four Loves, uh, based on four different Greek words for love, and I, I, I recommend the book, but th this is a, an excerpt. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. So, uh, why do we take the risk? Why do we take the risk of loving others? Why do we long to love and be loved? And what does God have to do with all of this? Well, that's the subject of 1 John 4, 7 through 12. And this great affirmation at the heart of this text is God is love. Now, more about that uh, in a minute. But there's another phrase that I'm going to focus on. There's a phrase that is repeated three times in this text, and you may have, you may have noticed it. Yeah, but repetition, remember, is biblical underlining. Love one another. It's three times in this short text. Love one another. Uh, now, before I get to that, uh, we have to define uh, what kind of love we're talking about here. Uh, the word, uh, and if you know any, any Greek at all, this is probably the, the very first uh, Greek word that you learned. Uh, maybe it's the only Greek word that you know. Agape. Uh, Agape is really different than romantic love. Uh, now, romantic love is a wonderful thing. Um, and I don't want to stand up here and be a, a killjoy about romantic love. It's wonderful. But that's not what John is talking about here. 
he's talking about agape. And agape is always a choice. Romantic love, by its nature, is involuntary, right? You're walking down the road one day and you get hit by a bolt of lightning and you're in love. We talk about, we talk about falling in love. You know, you, you meet somebody, you meet the right person, and it's like you're walking along, you fell in a hole. <laughs> and you're just happy and dopey. That's romantic love. It sweeps you away. It's powerful, it's exhilarating, it's good, and it's temporary. And anybody who's been married any length of time can tell you. It comes and goes, it, it's fickle. Um, a lasting marriage cannot be built on romantic love alone. Um, I gotta share a little poem with you, and I, I know it's one that I've shared with you before, but I like it so much, I gotta share it with you again. It's by uh, W.H. Auden, a uh, great poet. Oh, when I was in love with you, then I was clean and brave. And all around the wonder grew how well I did behave. But now the fancy passes by and nothing will remain. And by and by they'll say that I am quite myself again. Agape is something else. It's a choice, it's a decision. And it's a call to obedience. Romantic love cannot be commanded. Agape can. Jesus commanded, love one another as I have loved you. So he can't be talking about a feeling because a feeling cannot be commanded. He's talking about ways that we relate to others. And it's a conscious choice. Listen to 1 John 3.16. It's the defining statement of agape love just a chapter earlier than our text this morning. Once again, I, I believe this is the defining statement in the Bible of agape love. We know love by this, that Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. That's agape love, that Jesus laid down his life for us, and we lay down our lives for one another, and hopefully, hopefully not literally. Now, we know greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for another. And uh, we, we know moving examples of that, of people who have literally laid down their lives, but that's not what John is talking about here in this definition of agape love. He's, he means, by laying down our lives, to put self aside for the sake of another. Not being, it's not being defensive about my rights and what pleases me. In other words, to love like Jesus for the benefit of others. Okay, now that we have love defined, let's dive in deeper into our text. Why are we to love one another? First of all, the first reason John gives is because God is love. Because God is love. Look at verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is Love. Does, it, does everybody here know that song? Beloved, let us love one another. See, I'm getting into the singing thing. <laughs> For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Sing it with me, beloved. Yes, somebody else went to camp. Nice. 
uh, love one another because God is love. The living God is love. It's not just a characteristic of God, it is God's very nature. It's not just a peripheral thing that God does. It is God's heart. It is, it is who God is. God is love. Now, we can never get that confused and say, love is God. That's not true. But God is love. And this means that everything that God does is a function of his love. Uh, think of creation. God, God created the world out of nothing. God said, let there be light. And there was light. The fact that God is love tells us that God made the world in, and the universe in love. Cre creation is an act of love. And we can look out at the beauty of creation and see the love of God reflected. Think of the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in three and three in one. One God in three persons. Do you see what this means about the Trinity? That God's very nature is relationship and love within the persons of the Trinity. God experiences love within himself and every attribute, even God's righteous anger and wrath is a function of his love. Therefore, says John, because this is who God is, we are to love one another or we're not taking God seriously. If we feel no compulsion to get outside of ourselves, if we feel no compulsion to invest in the lives of others, if we think we're free to just be selfish and to look out for number one, then John says we do not know God. Whoever does not love does not know God for God is love. Now, no, no Christian is perfect in love. But if we really know God, we will invest ourselves in others because that's God's nature. The second love one another, the second time we find this phrase in this text is in verses 9 and 10. Let me read it for you again. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, made visible that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation, God sent his son to be the prop propitiation for our sins sins. I, I defined that term earlier for you. The death of Jesus on the cross, his great sacrifice, satisfied the righteous anger and wrath of God. That's the great price that God paid because God is love. And then verse 11 gives the logical implication, beloved, if God so loved us, and here it is, we also ought to love one another. Now, think for a minute. Who was God loving when he sent his son in love into the world? Uh, was God loving lovable people? No. God, God was loving people like us who, as the Bible says, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Um, dead people uh, are not very attractive. 
But we who were dead in our sin were given life. We who were guilty had the price paid by another. God, here's what I'm getting at. God didn't wait for us to be lovable before he loved us by sending his son into the world. And so when, when John says we are to love one another in the same way, that means we can't wait for others to be lovable. If we only love the lovable, as Jesus said, if, if, you, if you love only those who love you, Jesus said, how are you different from the pagans? If we love only attractive people, we haven't learned God's love. God did not send the Son for people who were already in love with him. He didn't send the Son for people who were already alive and and growing in faith and, and reaching out toward God. He didn't, he didn't send his son for people who were already pretty spiritual and just needed a little boost to get up toward God. God sent his son for people who were dead in their sins and made them alive. He sent his son for people who were guilty and made them clean. And the call for us, his children is to love people who are not attractive. People who are not going to make our lives easier. People who are not going to increase our prestige and stature. He he sends us to love people who are sometimes not pleasant to be around. And it's because we also were unlovely. But we received love from God. Now, I, I, wanna, I, wanna do, I do want to give a caution here. Um, everybody, for your own emotional health and your own spiritual health, uh, there, there's two kinds of people that God brings into your life. Uh, God will bring into your life people that feed your soul. God will bring into your life people who energize you and, and feed your faith just by being around them. <clears throat> God will also bring into your life people who uh, drain you. God will, God will bring into your life uh, people who are demanding and are not easy to be around. Okay? You, you need to be around both kinds of people. So, w- when I say that God calls us to love the unlovely, uh, that doesn't mean we need to spend 100% of our time with them. You need to be around people who feed your soul, but God calls us to be around, those, to, to love those who are not easy to love. Listen to Jesus. This is in Luke 14. Jesus said, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, Do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus invites us to a banquet. Who did he invite? He's invited us. The poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. 
we can't repay him. Love is risky. It's difficult. It demands much of us. In fact, it demands all we've got. It veers out of control. It hurts. But that's who God is, and that's how God loved us. Think of the risk that God took. God knew exactly what would happen when he sent his son into the world. There is no real Christianity without the radical call of Jesus to love one another as I have loved you. Now the third and final time we hear love one another is in verse 12. It says, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. It can also be translated, his love is made complete in us. In fact, I think that's a better translation. His love is made complete in us when we love one another. Now, let me ask a question. What could possibly be incomplete about the love of God? What, what can it mean his love is made complete in us? And another question it is certainly true, no one has seen God. But what is, what is John implying? Just this. God's love is made visible when we love one another and the world sees that it's real. That's how God's love is made manifest, made visible. Jesus said, by this all people will know that you are my disciples, that you memorize the Apostles' Creed. No, he didn't say that, did he? By this all people will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. That's how the love of God is made visible. That's how God is made visible. No one has seen God, says John. But if we love one another, God abides in us. His love is completed in us. It becomes visible. God becomes visible to the world in the love that people see in the people of God. Uh, you know, there are many things we can devote our lives to, and most of them are not worth the effort. I, I got to share with you something that I was just, I just shared with the men's Bible study the other day. Um, as, a, as a pastor, I consider it something of a professional responsibility to read the obituaries. Do you read the obituaries? It, it can be uh, it can be in a way uh, a wonderful inspiration to read the obituaries. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, a whole lot of obituaries that I read are incredibly, incredibly sad. And by that I mean the obituaries that'll go on and on about, oh, how he loved to play golf. And he played golf here and he played golf there. Or uh, she loved to travel and she traveled here and she traveled there and boy I, I hope your obituary won't be that sad what a what a, a wasted life but boy I, I love reading obituaries uh, about somebody who was dedicated to Jesus Christ and who served Christ, who served their neighbors in the world, uh, who demonstrated the love of Christ in the way that they in invested their life in the service of Jesus Christ and his, his kingdom. 
God has never been seen, but if we love one another, his love is made visible, made complete. God's love is made complete when we receive it and give it away. Now, once again, love is dangerous. We will get hurt. To love is to hurt. Remember what C.S. Lewis said, he was right on. But it's worth it because we were made for love. We were made to be loved by God and to love one another. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Let's pray together. Loving Father, we thank you that you loved us before we ever loved you. You loved us with an infinite, self-sacrificing love. And you sent your son Jesus into the world to die in our place. The greatest love gift ever given. Uh, God, continue your work of transformation in us that we might learn to love as we have been loved by you. And we pray that the way we love one another would faithfully make you visible in our world. And we pray it in the precious name of Jesus and for his sake, amen. I invite you to join with me uh, as we affirm our faith together. The words of the first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism, please stand as you are able. What is your only comfort in life and in death?
seated. And before I begin the Lord's Supper, I just want to make sure, did everybody get one of these little chalices when you came in? Okay. Remember that uh, text from Luke's Gospel that I read just a few minutes ago. Jesus said, when you give a banquet, don't invite the popular people. Don't invite the ones who will increase your status by being at table with you. But instead, invite the blind and the lame and the, the crippled, the outcast. And uh, that's what our Savior has done. Uh, he's invited the unlovable, you and me. And by his love, we are transformed, made new, so that we can love one another. So as we come to this table, know that it is not because of our worthiness but because of Christ's worthiness and the perfect sacrifice that he made on the cross that has called us into this intimate fellowship with him. You are invited to this table today if you are a baptized Christian if you're resolved to lead a new life by the power of the Holy Spirit, you're truly sorry for your sin, then you come uh, to this table and enjoy this banquet with our Savior. Uh, let me lead us in prayer. Let's bow together. Mighty Father, we lift our hearts in thanks and praise to you for you alone are worthy of all glory and honor and blessing and praise. We thank you for our Savior Jesus, who you sent into the world in love. God in the flesh, to show us who you are, to reveal your heart to us. We thank you that Jesus reached out to those who were outcast from society, the lepers and the, the blind and the, the, the deaf and the, uh, those who were considered immoral by polite society. Jesus welcomed all at his table. We thank you that Jesus welcomed sinners at his table and still does. 
We thank you that in answer to your call, Jesus took up the cross and on that cross freely, voluntarily offered his sinless life in place of ours. He gave the perfect sacrifice for sin that cleansed away our sin once and for all and made the bridge for us to come back to you, Father, that uh, we can now, because of Jesus, we can know and experience your love, your forgiveness, the power of new life in Christ. And we thank you for the hope we have in Christ that death is a defeated enemy. Death, death could not hold him. He was raised. He was raised from death to life. He, you now have exalted him over all. And one day he will return to judge the world in righteousness and to reign forever. We th thank you, God, for your presence here this morning, your Holy Spirit right here in this moment. And we pray that you would set apart these simple gifts, the bread and the cup, that as we eat this holy meal, we will be partaking with our Savior Jesus and be filled with his life once again. And we pray it in his name. Amen. Dear friends, I invite you now to remember it was on the night that he was betrayed that our Lord took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, take, eat, do this, remembering me. Eat of it, all of you. Now if you'll open the bottom portion of your cup and take out the little wafer. Remember that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will never hunger. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after they had eaten supper. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. And the apostle Paul tells us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, if you'll open the, the top portion the, the, that covers the cup. Remember that Jesus said, whoever drinks of me will never thirst. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this holy meal that we have shared in the spirit with Jesus, your son. And now as we leave uh, this banqueting table of our Lord and as we go out into the, into the world today, may we go in the strength of this meal. Uh, and may the light and love of Jesus flow through us to touch others, and we pray it in his name. Amen.
Thank you for all who uh, joined in on the, on the live stream. Uh, thankful that you also were a part of this worship service. Uh, and once again, uh, we don't have any goodies to share, uh, but uh, hopefully soon. And uh, but do stay after and pretend to drink a cup of coffee while you share a moment of fellowship uh, with. Uh, with some of your fellow uh, worshipers. Uh, if you have brought an offering today, there's a little basket uh, right up here on the table, uh, and you can just uh, leave it right there. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and evermore. Amen. And there is in your bulletin a responsive dismissal. Church, where are you going? We go forth to serve God's will as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Amen.